Okay, today we're going to be talking about a third version of the mechanical bump and go mechanism. I first saw this uh, single wheel bump and go drive being used by Tomy and their Dingbot back in the mid 1980s. And basically, they have a single wheel. As you can see it's angled and offset. It's just off center of the center post, and it can turn like this, and it's spring loaded so that it wants to return. Hits a stop right there for straight forward, but it can come all the way around if it needs to. In this particular case, I'm running it on a 3.7 rechargeable battery. Got a couple of idler wheels in the back, just an on off switch, and up on the top, it's a standard 148 TT gear motor, the most common of all of them. We'll take this apart and I'll show you how you can build it and link to the files. Um, this one's running, like I say, basically on 3 volts, 3.7, a little rechargeable cell. This one, I wanted to see how it would operate if we gave it the full 6 and the only uh, 4 battery holder that I had laying around was for double A's and flat. So I built a, a riser. It just sits over the top of it so I can hold the battery pack up there so it wouldn't be slopping around. Makes it kind of bulky, but... Uh, then we can see the difference in, in speed and reaction and how they work and everything. So let's turn this one on, set it down there. So you can see I've got a ruler set up across there. Hopefully that box will... Yep, it's kind of blocked by the camera. Wait, wait for it. This, this isn't ideal from a camera angle perspective. I have a better perspective, I guess, from where I'm sitting. Okay. So here on uh, 6 volts, I'll give that a peak. I like the speed better at 6. So you can see they can't get stuck, they uh, always come out of it, they always turn when they bump. So let's uh, wait for this guy to get around where I can reach it. There we go. So you can see what's happening is the, uh, the wheel is then trying to drive it forward, but if it bumps into something where it can't go forward any further, then this natural reaction is going to be to turn on its shaft because of the way the wheel's turning and the fact that the center of the wheel is just to this side of the center of the drive axle. So it makes it want to spin. Now the only tricky part of this when you're trying to make it something where any of you that are watching this or all over the world can build it is trying to come up, since there's a spring return involved, coming up with a way to do the spring part uh, where you could all find the same part. So. I did a couple different options on that. So there's a couple different options on the batteries you can use, um, options on the spring that you can use. In this case, I used a couple of screws to hold these rear idler wheels in there. And on this one, as you can see, I just ran a shaft all the way across. So there's there's options there. It just seemed like this was a lot of wasted space. So that's why I decided, eh, let's uh, let's try this this battery thing. Okay, I'm gonna move the camera and we'll take this thing apart we'll work in this area here okay I don't know how easy it's going to be to take it apart I've only just put it together uh, one of the hardest parts is going to be getting this shaft this is a three millimeter shaft that I'm using here. Again, you could probably use a one eighth rod. Uh, I used the three and uh, it goes in at an angle and has to come all the way down, down to there. It uh, fits snug into this wheel, but has to turn free into this part of the housing. And like I said, I haven't tried pushing this, this out, so I don't really know if I can do this. And we're, we're gonna find out just how tight it might be. Okay, used a small screwdriver. So here you can see the uh, 
three uh, millimeter rod. It's about one inch long. And I need to set that where I don't lose it. And that brings us down to this uh, wheel. This pin prints on your printer in this orientation. Obviously the rubber o-ring is something that you snap in after the fact. And because you're dealing with a gear, you're going to want to be 100% interfill and you want to be in quality, so probably uh, uh, 0 0.12, something like that. And that brings us down to this next part. This gear, which I'm going to remove with this screw, hold, this gear is held onto this shaft. It's a D-sized shaft. And um, we need to free that up next. I need to do that. So hardware-wise, the getting the, uh, the three millimeter shaft is going to be one thing for some of you, and then finding uh, like a number two machine screw like this to hold this little gear. See how it's got a D shaft like that. And it's inset like that. I can show you on the other side of the motor here. You can see how this would fit right on there. Then the screw just goes in and screws into the hole in the end of the motor to hold this all the way down. Now these motors have some end play in them, which in this case is good. So I've designed the length of this so that when it's tightened and held all the way down, that it's going to allow all of this stuff to work without, without binding in here. Um, let's see what's the best way to take this apart because now you're going to see the type of spring I decided to uh, to use so that guys anywhere in the world could probably come up with it there we go so this piece right here is actually two pieces this flat piece here prints flat on the printer and then this piece here prints flat on the printer but you glue the two together I know that's a little confusing so I'm going to move you over here and show you a picture right there so there's the two parts so you can see this is the one prints flat normally this would be down but you have to have supports because there's an inset there and then you dig the supports out and you put a little bit of glue around here stuff it in there and hold the two together until they're they're glued and that The zoom that's freaking me out. There we go. So that ends up making you a piece like this. Now the whole point of that is this is going to give us like a pulley place for our spring to reside so it doesn't maybe try to get bound up underneath there. So inside here you can see there's a flat surface here that this flat surface rides on. It's a bearing surface. PLA on PLA is pretty smooth. Now I always print with a smooth plate. A lot of, uh, for the last two, almost three years, textured plates have been all the rage. I personally hate them because I'm always doing mechanical parts. I need a smooth finish. I never use textured plates. If you're using a textured plate, you're probably going to have to take a file or sandpaper and sand your edges down until you get a smooth surface because we're not looking for a lot of friction to happen there. We're looking for something that uh, moves kind of easy. Okay, so what I have here, if we can keep it where you can kind of see it, is a guitar string. Now, the diameter of your guitar string is going to have a lot to do with how springy it is. So I, I built them two different ways. And this one, I used a probably one of the most common gauges of guitar string. It'd be like a super slinky, the high E string. And in this one, uh, the smallest guitar string diameter I could find for the weakest spring, which is what I was looking for, uh, actually came in a pack of 12 string. Because I also play 12 string guitar. If any of you follow the channel, you'll know all that kind of stuff. So I had this uh, set of strings here, and I noticed that if we go down to the G string, of course, you're on the G string and the 12 string, you're going to have one large string and you're going to have one really small string. And on the small one, it's uh, in millimeters, 0 0.2 millimeter. Uh, if you're going to go with the empirical, then it's 0 0.008 inches right there. 
and that's uh, smaller than the other one, which is more typical like the uh, if you use super slinkies on your guitar, your high E string is probably going to be a uh, 0 0.01 in inches or 0 0.25 millimeter in metric. And in this one, I used the heavier one, the more standard one. So this is a little bit stiffer. And I didn't, you want it to move as free as it can possibly move as long as it can return back to going forward. If the spring was too weak, then the wheel would just want to crawl. And the thing would always be going, you know, in an angle. So this is the smallest standardized string that I could find. It's also sold as piano wire. So you might be able to just find an individual piano wire that's uh, of the gauges that I just mentioned. You're going to cut yourself about you know four and a half inches of it or so. This end here we've got dual dual holes as you can see. The front hole is going to be the long one that's going to wind around that and the back one is going to have a bend in it so it can come around and tuck back in there. It'll probably be the most finicky part of the whole whole build. There. So normally it's going to be pulled up in place like that. Now this half here, when this thing prints, you'll notice there is a small hole there. So we're going to fish this end, which we've kind of bent what was going to show up best. Against gray maybe? And yeah, gray's not great. I guess you can kind of see it. What do I need? Something more more black? It's just so dang small. At any rate, you're going to do a bend on that. There you can see it more or less. And the idea is that you can fish it in into that pulley area that we made like a well, like of that and bring it around this way because we're going to wrap we're going to wrap the string st guitar string and just set it down in there like that and once you've got it wrapped around and everything's sitting down in there then you need to grab this part so you can kind of hold it all together and I'm not sure what I'm fighting Mostly, I'm fighting trying to keep stuff in camera and look in the real world with my real eyes at what I'm doing. There we go. And if that's there, then we should be able to test this action. I can see that this end that I bent on this for catching that other hole is popped out of place. Let's get that in there. There we go. Yeah, moves real easy. Then you're going to take your number two screw like I say, that might be the one of the trickiest parts of the hardware for you guys to locate, but I'm sure you can find some place online to buy one if you haven't got something laying around in your junk box. And uh, you tighten that down. Now when that's tightened down, like I said, because of the end play in this motor, that should keep things from binding up and yet not being too sloppy out here. So everything should, should kick around and move freely. The wheel you kind of walk it in from the side just kind of rotate it and walk it in like that in this case um, after it prints I took a, a three millimeter drill bit and ran it through there a bunch of times so that I knew I could get this shaft in and out without too much difficulty I don't want it to fit too tight Yet, I don't want it totally sloppy because I don't want this pin falling out. And I don't want to be trying to put any glue down in there because I'll end up gluing the wrong things. Now, you, before you even assemble all this in there, you might want to take that shaft and run it through this part. This, you know, by this way, I meant it. That we talked about this part earlier where I said it prints with uh, supports because of that cutout on the bottom that we're gluing to. But it also needs the supports to keep these these holes clear, these square holes clear. And then you pull that stuff out. Anyway, you want to make sure that your shaft can go from there and all the way down to the bottom one and spin completely freely. If it can't, then you may want to take your drill bit 
and easily put it down there. You don't want to egg anything out. You don't want it too sloppy, but you need to know that, that sh this shaft can, in fact, turn freely. If it's a little snugger than I'd like, but uh, we're going to deal with it. So I worked the wheel in, then I'm going to uh, work the axle in, like so. And I need to know that it has gone there and I had my finger on this side when I was pushing so I could feel the axle. You'll know when it's in place because this gear will then engage with that right angle gear and won't slip. If you don't have the axle in far enough or not all the way in, then this will be slipping and won't, uh, won't fit. And then you can test your mechanism. And it should work. All kinds of stuff for it to bump into here. So, must have a little burr or something in there because it's uh, catching on its own. But you get the idea. It's a pretty simple build. There aren't that many parts. Two wheels, just the frame. You got this piece, the little pulley piece underneath, this wheel, and that gear. Not too many parts. The hardest thing you may have uh, is coming up with your, your guitar strings and you don't want to pull them too tight. In the case of this one, since I knew this spring was a lot a lot tighter, you actually can kind of see it looped up, up there because it is a larger gauge. I just experimented, pull it through the hole, and I would pull it through. When, if it didn't return all the way, I'd pull it a little bit more just till I knew I could get a nice snap action. Then I, in this particular case, I just bent it and left it there because I wasn't sure whether I was going to leave that one in there or not. And uh, this works the same way. This is the one on 6 volts, of course. Nothing wrong with the 6 volt one, other than I got this huge pack sitting here on top. I mean, a person could, uh, could run their batteries vertically this way and poke them up that way, or you could stand it out the back, although you want to keep some of your weight on the front so this wheel, you know, has some uh, traction to, to drive with. But, there it is. It's your Type 3 of the mechanical bump-and-go mystery action drives. Say the first time I saw this particular version was in the uh, Tomy Dingbot back in the mid-1980s.